issue of integrity. And these are some of the traits that you pick when you do practical interviews for, for BA. So to sum it all up, it's honesty, independence, willingness to learn, and compatibility. I think those are the four things that I look at when, I, when I'm hiring a BA. Okay, this, this is quite an interesting question. Um, I think uh, you've put on some very um, top problem, honesty, uh, primarily, and uh, maybe compatibility. But maybe Natasha, I think you wanted to say something. Yeah, I think I was going to um, kind of take the, the thought around compatibility a little bit further. I think it's it's the elephant in the room because it could be prone to bias um, as well as subjectivity. So compatible from whose perspective and whose point of view. Um, and just thinking about it a bit further is, you know, when I think compatibility and, and not to put words in Eugene's mouth, but, you know, culture as, as kind of a word comes to mind. Um, and so when I think about how we hire um, at MFS Africa, we, we really put people through the paces um, where they, give or take will meet between six to 10 people within the organization. Um, and, and that really is geared at making sure that the individual is very clear in terms of culture and has that insight from different people sitting in various parts of the organization, um, but also that they are kind of making an informed decision um, because yeah, I think everything rises and falls on culture. Um, and yeah, to, to what Eugene said, the, the compatibility piece is, is key. And, you know, we have had instances where someone is great from a technical standpoint, um, but, you know, sort of has certain attributes that we know will not bode well in our environment. Um, and it's not that they are a bad candidate, they are just not right for us. Um, and so, yeah, I think that piece is really critical. And I would say for anyone looking at opportunities in a new organization, do not underestimate culture, um, you know, and, and we think about culture as the way things are done around here. And if you are leading from a place where you're really self-aware, um, you should be able to navigate this and, and know as you go through an interview process whether a company will, will be the right fit for you and vice versa. So, yeah, definitely the compatibility piece is, is key. Um, and so would, uh, would, would just say don't overlook that um, as you think about um, whether you're applying to a new role or transitioning within your current position to another team. Okay. No, um, thanks a lot for this, uh, Natasha. So, and Eugene, so one of my takeaways that I'm kind of getting is that uh, possibly if I get that email in my inbox that says, uh, we regret to let you know, sometimes it's not about me or competency per se, but it's it's really to say maybe I'm not a good fit for this particular role um, based maybe on the interview process that we've gone through. And it's not necessarily a knock on my capacity or ability, right? Would that be a good um, way to look at it? Yeah, no, and I think, you know, a good organization will give you specific feedback. So I would encourage people to, to, to get that feedback um, where possible. Um, not every organization can give feedback to, you know, every single candidate um, that's applied for a role. But yeah, if you have the opportunity to, I would encourage you to do that um, so that you you know um, where you did really well and, and where maybe there wasn't quite um, the, the right fit. Great. So, okay. Oh, wonderful. From um, where I stand, yeah, if you look at us on this call, there are 20 of us. We all can be BAs. So if we're gunning for the same post, in terms of the academic qualification, we are at par. If it's about the skill, I would say we are all at par. But what sets you apart from the rest of us on this call? And that's what you need to bring out during your the interview process. You, you realize that even sometimes during the interview process, be it the verbal one, be it the practical one, there are certain people who exhibit a, a don't care attitude. And I would say 
my my principle is I would rather deal with someone who lacks skill because I can train that person than being with someone who lacks will. Because skill you can train, but will you can't do anything about it. Back to you, Tafaz. Okay. No, interesting uh, perspective there. Um, I see there's questions already coming in through the chat. Thanks for those guys. I think uh, today you can moderate those for us and then uh, uh, I'll just call upon for, for those questions shortly. Um, an interesting point that uh, you guys have both spoken to, um, Eugene and Natasha, is the, is the use of uh, a practical assessment. I think this is something, well, relatively new, um, where I think organizations look to maybe at the first phase, or I don't know, maybe depending on different organizations, where they put that. But there's this element of uh, testing for practical skill. Now, uh, I just kind of want to have maybe a bit of understanding into the thinking that's behind that. Is it to say we want to confirm that you are um, as good as you say? What do you look for in that practical assessment? Do you want, um, is it open? Am I looking for creativity? Or do you want to see how, to what extent I can really meet the standards, you know, maybe use BPMN 4.0 and all the standards and, you know, go to town showcase that I can do all those things. What's in the practical interview? Why a practical inter um, exercise in an interview? All right, so what I look for, um, one, your communication skills. Number two, critical analysis and thinking. You mentioned um, pro problem solving. I think uh, even the application of tools, your ability to utilize tools and frameworks that, um, that are available out there. So those are um, some of the things that I look out for. And you realize that during that practical interview, um, I see Garnet spoke about how you assess the compatibility. There might be a bit of bias because there is not enough, enough time during a practical interview, but there are certain things that you look out for. If you look at, um, I would say visual, visual. Um, okay, I would say if you look at your presence and how you communicate, if you um, go into text about communication and theories, you you realize that the bulk of our communication is nonverbal. So those are some of the things that I look at as I conduct practical interviews. The gestures that you make, how you, the tone that you put through as um, to a customer or as you receive feedback from a customer. Some of the traits that you, you look at as you assess compatibility and culture fit. Okay, yeah, uh, interesting, interesting take on that one, uh, Eugene. Natasha, uh, your thoughts on, on the same? Yeah, so for us, we at MFS Africa, we, we in the first stage, so before we even interview an individual, um, we put out what is probably commonly known as a case study, um, but internally we re refer to it as a recruitment assignment. And the purpose of that is twofold. Number one, it tests motivation to join because when we think about putting those assignments together, on average, you'd spend about two hours, um, perhaps doing a little bit of research and then actually putting the assignment together. And so you would send it through to us um, as, as a PowerPoint and answering two to three very specific questions that are largely hypothetical, um, but give us an insight into the sort of knowledge base you have. So Eugene mentioned, you know, the theories, the models, the approaches that you might use. Um, and then it might test one or two things within that BA profile, whether it's problem solving, whether it's creativity, et cetera. Um, and then the second thing is before we even meet you, it gives us um, some sort of idea as to the kind of individual you are. So 
to maybe give an extreme case, you know, if somebody hands in a late assignment already, that sort of tells us something about the individual. Um, if, you know, there's four different types of font, there's spelling errors, they've used um, charts or graphs inappropriately, already that kind of gives us a sense of the, the individual before we've met them. Um, of course, not everyone that submits an assignment will pass, but by the time we then have that first interview, it really makes for a robust conversation because you've given us work product um, that we can then use as the basis to delve a little bit deeper into your technical skills. So we found it to be a really useful um, tool in that initial stage of the recruitment process. Um, and then, yeah, from there it would then proceed to kind of your normal competency-based interviews. So I think it's a, a great way to get an initial, uh, initial sort of view of what this person will potentially bring to the table um, in a very tangible way. Um, and yeah, I think just feedback from individuals that we have taken through our process, they quite like that assignment because you know, first round interview feels like an awkward first date. <laughs> um, but if they've done the assignment, even in the way that it's worded and phrased, they kind of get an idea of what our potential challenges are as a business. They've spoken to that. And it's a bit of a warmer first round interview um, in that respect. So we found it quite useful. Okay, quite interesting. So um, I'm just going to ask this. I think everybody who's ever done it practical assessment has this question. I'm going to ask it for everyone. You'll answer it for everyone. Do you guys give us realistic scenarios of problems that you have in the business? And what happens to the artifacts I create? Are they possibly like, you know, intellectual property that then goes into the company's database? Or are these just hypothetical situations and, you know, afterwards, if you don't use it, you just throw it in the bin or something? <laughs> Yeah, so I would say we keep ours quite quite generic um, because, as you rightly said, we also wouldn't want to expose an actual, you know, live problem that we're dealing with. Um, but we can certainly frame it in a way that you know could even be something that looks retrospectively at a scenario or situation that we have faced um, previously as a business. Okay. Uh, so yeah, of course. You know, we can argue what then happens to that as IP, but for us, it's, it's really how you would approach it versus did you give a right or wrong answer? Um, okay. okay. No, I just thought to ask because I've been curious. Uh, Eugene, you want to uh, say something? <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. So, um, pretty much, these are hypothetical situations, hypothetical okay. questions. However, mm. the, the, Purpose is to ask, uh, to assess how you you tackle problems. Let me give you an example. I know Natasha spoke about someone who who delivered uh, an assignment late. Mm -hmm. I was faced with a situation where it doesn't apply to a BA; it applies to a developer. Um, gave out a practical assessment to a developer. It was a simple assessment. Write a code, piece of code that adds one and two and gives out an answer. This guy submitted late, but you know what he did? He went for an amnesty. He actually wrote well in advance to say, I might not be able to, to deliver well on time. I might not be able to deliver on time, which was perfect. The managers in my department didn't want to consider this person, but I said, let's, let's consider him. It's a good trait. The next thing is what he delivered, unlike what everyone else delivered, it wasn't a case of just saying, let's add one and two together. You, as, as you know, with technology, there are different approaches. What this guy did is he actually said, enter the first number. Then he says, input one. Enter the second number, input two. Did the computation and said, the answer is three. You understand? So it's the thing is, I, I I wouldn't keep such a piece of code because it's generic, but it allowed us to to look at and 
figure out how this person thinks and how they, they can tackle problems. And that's the purpose of um, a practical interview. All right, uh, I think quite some interesting scenarios in there. And I think um, for me, just based from your guys' responses, maybe one of the key takeaways is, I think it's an opportunity maybe to flex, um, you know, your professional um, acumen, you know, in as much as probably maybe in a verbal interview, you kind of have to answer specific questions. This is kind of like an opportunity to go to town, be a bit more creative and kind of show what um, sets you apart, I guess, in addition to just kind of, Ticking the checkbox that you know how to do what's the bare minimum, you know, fonts, uh, the application of appropriate models, etc. But that's just my my takeaway. Um, there's just another one uh, very important key area that I just kind of wanted to get an overview of before I think we get into feedback from the guys because I know uh, probably just based off what we've discussed, people already have thoughts and questions. I just kind of wanted to understand the whole construct behind, um, I know, I think most organizations these days will use some sort of an ERP, um, you know, to collect um, CVs, resumes, uh, cover letters, whatever um, means of application is happening there. Um, I, I don't know to what extent you guys have experience with this. I'm just curious. I would want to know what happens in the backend. Um, is the system filtering my CV itself? Um, is it just a means of um, organizations to collect CVs, then somebody's actually going to go through? Um, okay, I see I'm corrected there. It's uh, actually an application tracking system, is it today? <laughs> yeah. Uh, are they just, is it just somewhere a repository where I'm putting in my CV and then somebody from, you know, uh, human resources or PepOps is actually going to come through and read through all of them? Or is this system actually doing your first level kind of like filtering already? Mm -hmm. Um, I'll allow the hiring tool to go first. <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, so I would be curious in terms of what what you would prefer the answer to be, Sam. <laughs> but <laughs> I will. Uh, I prefer I'll... to be the truth. I want to know. <laughs> so I think with any system, you've got a spectrum, right? So you have quite basic systems. Um, to, to really advanced systems. Um, and I think for me, being in a tech business, you know, we're constantly looking, even though I sit in, in the people operations team, how we can leverage technology um, and, and, you know, not sort of assume that we are in a separate space um, to the rest of the business. So tools is, is really a critical part of that. But I think when you look at the recruitment process in its entirety, you know, you can't avoid human intervention. Um, and so most of the systems will initially collate CVs. Um, they don't necessarily spew out a short list, um, but you can certainly do keyword searches um, on CVs and it, it could potentially pull um, CVs with particular skills. But the tracking systems that do that require you to have a standard CV format. So you'll actually need to replicate your CV um, in the standard format. Otherwise, the filtering on the back end of the system doesn't work. Um, then you've got other systems where they literally just collate in whatever format you've sent your CV, whether it's Word, PowerPoint, PDF, et cetera. Um, and the one we make use of requires um, the hiring manager to actually go in and filter CVs. Because at the end of the day, you don't want to have CVs fall through the cracks. Um, and there's going to be no perfect screening system that isn't a human. Um, and, and I can give examples. Um, you know, you might say uh, you wouldn't want to see anyone with less than, you know, three years experience. Um, and so it gives you a particular list, but there could be a candidate that has less than three years experience, but the experience that they've had suits the role that you're recruiting for. So that person might then fall through the cracks. Um, so we place a lot of uh, focus on the hiring manager uh, actually going through the CV. Um, and I know it's, it's quite a challenge for some roles because of, of the volume of people that, um, that respond, but we play a support role in that regard, but we believe the hiring manager knows best 
the kind of skill in their team um, and in looking at a CV, they will be, a, be the best judge um, of whether this individual um, meets their requirements more than we would sitting um, outside of, of their team. So yeah, depending on the system, you do have a variety, but most kind of collect CVs and whether it's an HR or people operations team um, or the hiring manager, there is that human intervention required um, to, to filter. And, and there are some recruitment agencies um, as part of their services that will filter CVs for you and present a shortlist. So they kind of do that, um, that filtering for you, but it, it, it largely depends. Um, for us, every CV that comes through is an opportunity to know someone in a particular field, industry, in a location that we wouldn't have known of otherwise. And whilst we may not proceed with them you know, we, from a proactive standpoint, think it's really important to get a sense of who is in the market, who's interested in our business. Um, and so we want that kind of human element um, in, in the shortlisting, because we then get a sense of, of, of that broader talent pool. Um, not everyone will filter through into the process, but we can certainly keep people as kind of more passive candidates you know, for future roles or as bench strength um, as we think about workforce planning. Okay, well, quite interesting. Uh, Eugene, uh, from a local Zimbabwean perspective, and I also know that for a fact that EcoCash Holdings uses a, a, some sort of technology thing. What's happening yeah. to our CVs? <laughs> well, it's, it's, the same, it's the same scenario as what Natasha covered. And yeah. of course, if you are unsuccessful for this role, what we'll then do is we'll keep your CV and mm -hmm. we refer to those CVs at some point in future. So we, we don't throw away those CVs. But oh, I just okay. wanted to show um, a scenario. I work with Indians a lot. In India, they just put out an advert. You bring your CV, you, put, you keep outside like they're doing an audition and you're interviewed oh. without a notification. <laughs> so, uh, okay. But looking at as, as, as um, a global village now, we might actually be drifting towards that. Okay, so hypothetically, we should expect maybe to just be queued on a Zoom call with uh, your CV on end. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> okay, uh, quite an interesting take. Um, maybe Tendai, I'll, I'll give the opportunity to you. Uh, you've been looking at the questions that, that have come through. I don't know if you want to give them to, to the askers or if you want to uh, go through them yourself. Thanks, Sam. I think I'll just call out the, the, the question that keeps on coming up. I think um, the popular question is around technical skills, right? So we've got Garnet asking, what does technical mean in this context? We've got Rachel also asking, what are the technical skills that um, hiring managers are looking for from business analysts? So I think I'll put that question out to um, Eugene and Natasha first. All right, thank you. So I work in a FinTech setup. So when I say technical, I mean information technology. But if you are maybe interviewing for a BA role, say at a mine or in an agricultural setup, you need to have that background and that understanding of the core business um, of the company that you, you wish to join so that they know that you're not starting from scratch. Um, I think that's, that's it from, for me. Uh, I don't know, Natasha. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... And, and I often say to hiring managers, don't just look at a job title. So they might be recruiting for you know, a product manager and then they are looking at product manager CVs um, as potential. But the context in which you are a product manager is, is, makes material difference. Um, and I think to your point, Eugene, we definitely want individuals who will hit the ground running. So if they come from a payment space, that definitely um, aligns better to, to our core business, um, given what we do at MFS Africa. So it's, it's technical within the context of our particular business. Um, and, and I suppose one could argue, you know, and this is always an ongoing conversation, 
in terms of the, the extent to which skills transfer from one industry to another. But then on the other side is sort of the potential employer. It's, it's about the extent to which they're then willing to train, et cetera. So um, I think where companies sit um, on their openness to your background depends on those other things as they think about onboarding you um, around, yeah, just the amount of time, resources, effort that they can give to people not coming from the industry to, um, to then learn the skills in the new context before they can start adding value. So that, that would be what technical yeah, means. Great, thank you, Eugene and Tasha. Um, I see we've got a hand up, um, Garnet. Yeah, I'd like to probably disagree with a couple of points that have been raised here regarding the technical definition because what has been described is basically industry knowledge which you think I think that you can actually some do some research on yes experience in an industry it helps quite a bit but it, it depends on how you place your your BAs within you know, your organization really because to be honest with you sometimes when you're recruiting for a BA I'd like to have somebody who's got a fresh perspective on things somebody who doesn't have a preconceived ideas of how the industry should be operating and I find that for the most part those are the people that usually have the brightest ideas, the, the most effective solutions. And it all comes down to how, far, how much value do you place on the BA and um, what kind of insight are they bringing to the organization? Because I can tell you right now, if you keep on hiring the people from the same industry, they usually have the same solutions and they don't bring that fresh perspective on things. So technical, what you guys are describing, I'll probably describe it as industry knowledge of which for me, a technical skill of a BA is how do you run your meetings? How do you write your use cases? Those are the technical abilities that I think you should be assessing for a BA. The other stuff that you guys are describing, I probably would probably say those are not really technical skills, but they're just industry knowledge, which for me, I place less value on that, to be honest. I've recruited BAs in the financial sector, working for a bank and I'll be recruiting somebody who was in media in the past because a BA in my mind is just how do you approach problem and learning about an industry is not, it's not complicated. It's just basic training really. At least that's how I see things. I've got a different opinion on how you recruit and what you're looking for in a BA. I'm more concentrated on the competencies rather than the industry knowledge. That's what I would say on this. Great, thank you, Garnet. Natasha and Eugene, um, your response to, to that? All right, so there are different approaches to, to any problem. Um, I would say this approach is a good approach, but if you look at the, the industry that I work in, I would not want someone who's coming in raw because the time that I would take to train that person, I will lose out on my targets. So yes, industry knowledge, but to me, it's, it's about how I can push you in the deep end. Remember, I mentioned the independence aspect, how I can put you in the deep end, and I know that I can trust that you will handle whatever meetings and I'll get good documents coming from you and my developers can quickly um, translate the requirements into uh, software and solutions. So I would say, yes, um, his approach works, but it's situational. Thank you, and back to you. Thanks, Eugene. I'm Natasha. Then we, I see you kind of no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we got video on, which is great. Yeah, to see yeah. The body mm. language. Look, um, you know, there are many ways to skin a cat, right? As the old adage goes. Um, you know, I often probe with people that we interview what their previous interviews experiences have been um, and, and kind of think about how we might refine or think about our interview process. Um, so it's never a case of right or wrong, but what we found is, again, to, to, to Eugene's point, is the ability to hit the ground running. Um, and without going into too much detail, you know, every interview in every business kind of has a particular cycle. Um, for us, in terms of how we measure the company's performance, it's a daily, it's a daily measure of performance. Um, and 
it's specifically around the amount of transactions that are processed over our, our platform. So in our world, you know, to train somebody for six months is almost a lifetime. Um, and so we have then made that choice. And it's not to say that we would completely disregard people coming from other industries. I mean, even if I think of some of the BAs in our business, how they even became BAs, you know, was is, it was quite different. We have one individual who came from a client relationship management background. We came have another BA who came from uh, a software development background, etc. But in interviewing both those individuals who have been successful in our business, we've really pushed them through the interview process, and they have shown us that they are able to pivot um, and transfer the skills that they've learned, albeit from slightly different backgrounds. So we're not saying it's impossible. Um, looking retrospectively at people who have succeeded in this particular um, kind of job family, coming from payments, definitely the learning curve is not as steep and they hit the ground faster. But for those who haven't, they've sold to us and even through the recruitment process, we have seen signs of them having really gone into a lot of research on our industry, et cetera. So it's, it's down to how quickly you need to see the person add value um, and, and how rigid or, or flexible you are um, as, as a business to that. But certainly people coming from different industries can absolutely get their foot in the door. We don't completely um, exclude them. But as I said, those two specific individuals that I have in my mind who didn't come from our industry showed through the interview process that willingness to learn and, and were already telling us how we need to think about things. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's down to when you are hiring and how quickly you need the person to, to start adding value. Okay. Thanks, Natasha. Thanks, Eugene. I also just want to highlight um, the concept of um, business analysts um, being consultants. I think a lot of us are called in to deal with certain projects for different industries. I often say to, to a lot of um, students that I teach and mentor and coach that the strength of a business analyst for me is the adaptability. The, the adaptability being able today to be in finance, and next day to be in oil and gas, the next day to be in ph pharmaceutical. I think just to highlight, not to take a lot of time, if I look at my career, right? So predominantly when I was in South Africa, I was in the financial services industry, but having moved to where I am, right now I'm in retail right I came and I was hired in retail because I had the core skill set of analytical problem solving learning you know all of those skills that are mentioned by the competency model so from my perspective I when I look at BAs hiring for my team from business analysts I don't look at industry specific I look at the core set of skills how can you solve a problem how can you you know do various items that are there within right user stories right use cases all of these things that we're talking about right and then if you've got that skill it should be very easy for you to be able to adapt to, to another environment, right? Because one of the key learnings or one of the key attributes of a business analyst is the ability to learn. So the learning aspect is key. Go there, browse through the BA book, browse through the competency model. They speak about the learning aspect, but not to take up too much time. Garnet, any response before we move on to the next questions? No, I'll just echo your sentiments really for the most part, because when we talk about the core competence of a BA, learning is actually a skill of which I kid you not, learning about an industry is not that complicated. If you have a BA who asks the right question, because remember a BA is either you're solving a problem or you want to explore an opportunity that's there. And I can learn about your job within a couple of days if I'm well prepared and I'm asking the right questions. So the previous experience that I might have in an industry, it carries less water for me as compared to somebody who asks the right questions. Like I said, if anything, I want somebody with a fresh perspective on problem solving. For me, if you come from media and I'm from user experience for the most part, because you understand media. So I would love that. You can come in and then you can tell me this is how you used to approach things in a media company and how do we apply that in the fintech industry. And somebody with that kind of diverse thinking, they actually add more value for the most part than somebody with a preconceived notion of how industry should be operating. So like what Tindai said, I like to echo everything that you said. Learning is a skill. And as part of your BA process, learning about a domain is something that you definitely need to do and you plan for that. So if you ask the right questions, the industry knowledge then becomes um, a redundant skill during an interview process. I focus on the person, 
Do you know how to ask the right questions? Are you articulate? Can you present in front of people? Can you, can you sell a solution? Because sometimes as a BA, you remember you're thinking sometimes and you're trying to solve a problem. So are you able to have that conversation? Do you ask the right questions? Do you have that EQ, Natasha, that you touched on from, 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 from the get-go? Because mm -hmm. a BA should be able to communicate from the person who's doing the data capturing right up to the CEO. Because the CEO is going to tell you the vision, what we're trying to achieve, and you should be able to dumb it down to somebody who is typing the keys, somebody who is meeting the clients. And, um, and if you're able to operate on those spectrums, then I would hire you because you're adding value on both ends. And hitting the ground running is, is a fallacy to me. If you are well prepared and you're motivated, believe me, you'll hit the ground running. That's, that's my opinion on it. And, and Tina, just to, to echo what you said, which I think is so pertinent, um, you know, I often think about what students are learning now vis-a-vis -vis what we are facing in, you know, real life corporate environments and the degree to which that disconnects and what you said specifically around coaching and mentoring. Um, for me is what will take you to the next level. So you only know what you know. And so it's about exposing yourself to people within the industry who can almost accelerate that learning for you so that you aren't waiting for you know x y and z projects to learn abc skills that you are actively engaging and interacting with people in your professional network who can literally be the individuals to augment what you're learning in your day to day um, and that kind of accelerated learning path through mentoring for me is is, is critical and, and something yeah, everyone should be pursuing. Fantastic. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Garnet. Thank you, Eugene. It's an ongoing debate. I know since we, <laughs> it's, it's been there for years, right? And this yeah. debate, like we said, there's no right or wrong, but I, I know that it's very, um, it's ongoing and you can read up. There's a lot of literature. There's a lot of articles on BA Times on Modern Analyst about this, this debate. So um, I think it's pertinent just to move on to one more question, Sam. I, I think it's, we nearly at the top of our, I don't know if anyone had a burning Kurai. I see you had quite a lot of questions. Um, Sam, do you want to say anything before? I hand over to the next question. Yes. Yeah, please. Um, okay. No, I just wanted to kind of, uh, uh, kind of reiterate and kind of put together what I'm also hearing, you know, just uh, from a learning perspective. Mm -hmm. I think my, my key uh, takeaways there is to say, number one, um, it's going to be very important for, for me if I'm trying to get into a role to understand the organization and their background, what matters in the particular organization you're trying to get into. So obviously, based on the debate that we are, um, you know, I've just been listening to, there's a very wide spectrum or uh, schools of thought around what's going to get me into this specific organization. And I guess it also ties back to what uh, Jim and Natasha mentioned at the beginning, the culture and everything. Um, what kind of an organization am I trying to get into? What kind of things do I need to, you know, push forward for me as a candidate trying to get into that job? Um, I think uh, I've seen there's been a number of uh, questions, like you said, there's a lot of debate about CV writing um, and people, some people say, no, you know what, customize your CV for every job that you're applying for. I think um, if guys are getting this, these are some of the nuances that you're customizing for. If you're gonna apply to Eugene's organization, you know, okay, these guys prioritize A, B, C, D. And if you want to be part of that, then you need to show that through your CV, you can't use the same one and apply to Garnet's organization where maybe he's looking for something that, you know, that's a bit different. So I think just to kind of um, put it together, but yeah, I think it's fine. We can go back to the questions, but it's a very interesting debate. Wish we had more time. This seems like a very rich conversation to have. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll hand back to you today to go back to, to the questions. At least if some, you, it looks like he wants to say something. <laughs> Sorry, apologies, Eugene, are you good? Yeah, I'm good, let's, let's move on. Okay, okay. Let's All right. Okay, so Kurai, I know there are three questions. I'm going to give you the opportunity to just ask one question. The other questions, I think we can always take them back to the panel. They can get back to you. So I'll give, I'll leave it the floor up to you, Kurai, if you are comfortable, just to unmute and ask the question that is really burning out of all three. Over to you. Well, uh, okay, let me just see what was the first one. Um, okay, um, let me ask this. The first one. How do you? How do you assess the how do you do a performance assessment on a BA? Is there an objective set of KPIs that can be used, or is it subjective? Um, I just wanted to get some insights on this on this one. Thank you. 
Thanks, Karai. Um, Natasha or Eugene? All right, I'll, I'll start. So looking at the various performance management systems in various organizations, um, well, I, I have raised um, a query at some point with, uh, within our performance management system and certain changes were made uh, thereafter. I would say for an individual performance agreement, it needs to have smart objectives. Uh, I'm sure we all know the acronym SMART. The biggest challenge that we have in most organizations is performance agreements or performance assessments are done using objectives which are not SMART. And in the end, they drift from being objective to subjective. If you plan your roadmap well in advance for the year and you know the services that you want to offer and the services of the BA that you require, your performance assessment document should specifically highlight the deliverables. When you come to the performance as assessment moment, it should be binary. You were supposed to deliver this document on this date. Was it done? Yes or no? Tick or not tick? The moment you leave room maybe for a, a, a scoring system which ranges from zero to five, you have an issue and it becomes a subjective assessment instead of an objective. I would say deliverables should be at, um, documented at the beginning of the period because you know the projects that you want to deliver for the business. Clearly list your, your, your projects, clearly list your deliverables. When it comes to assessment time, it has to be a zero or a one, then you move forward. I will hand it uh, over to you, um, Natasha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, this is something we could probably debate, but I think the starting point which Eugene alluded to is to know how your organization measures performance. Um, you know, often I've seen individuals put effort into things that don't move them forward to what the business deems as kind of these mission critical um, goals. So I agree um, in terms of goals being smart because it then makes the process a lot fairer and a lot more transparent, but really interrogate and understand the basis of measuring performance as it pertains to your specific company. And then within that, make sure you have smart goals. Um, and one of the other things that I think is important is even if it's not happening from your manager's point of view, you should be proactive in making sure at any point in the year you know how you are tracking against those goals. Um, I think the one part of having binary goals, you know, did you achieve something, yes or no, outside of ongoing feedback means that at some point there can be a disconnect. And a manager who perhaps doesn't communicate a change in the business's position concerning a particular product or service um, going live you are then putting effort into something that has been deprioritized. So come performance review time, you've put in effort into something that has shifted in priority from a business perspective. So I would say, understand how your particular business man measures performance, um, make sure that your goals are smart and clear, and that should be a collaborative process between you and your manager. And then whether or not your manager gives you ongoing feedback, be proactive in, in getting that ongoing feedback. Um, but whether there are specific KPIs linked to being a business analyst, well, it's delivery in your role. So what a business analyst will do will obviously be different um, depending on, on the company. So that's kind of the binary aspect, but nuanced by some of the things I mentioned um, around making sure your goals are smart and that ongoing feedback to keep you on track. 
Thanks, Natasha and Eugene. I think also just to highlight that um, from a business analyst competency level for us who are business analysts on the call, there is a competency model that speaks to what are the key skills, right? Competencies being um, the qualities, right? The skills, ab abilities you must have from a junior level to a medium, <laughs> intermediate to a senior, right through to team manager role, right? Um, not to get too technical, but you know, within the six core knowledge areas that we play as, as a business analyst, right? From solution evaluation right through to strategy analysis right the competency model really outlines to say if you're a junior business analyst right when it comes to requirements gathering this is at least the, the minimum that you must have right to be considered a junior business analyst right through to if you're a senior business analyst right this is the kind of requirements gathering skills that you must have right so there is an element of project delivery delivery yes right um i think with all projects we look at time cost and scope right have you delivered within time within budget as well as the scope but over and beyond that i think what's critical is your self growth as a business analyst when i'm looking at performance assessments i'm looking at the six core knowledge areas and how have you progressed in terms of um, you know, requirements gathering, in terms of solution evaluation, requirements lifecycle management. For those of you guys who are familiar with this, Kurai, I think we did touch on, on a lot of this um, during the course as well, so you'll be able to, you're aware of it. Kurai, any questions? Are you happy with, with the answer? Can we move on? Yeah, good. Okay, great. Um, Sam, I'll put it over to you, because I know we, we, we exactly one hour. I'm not sure what time we've got I... in terms of proceeding with more questions. So I, I had raised my hand. There the is also a dimension to do with customer satisfaction indexes, where instead of me doing an evaluation, a performance evaluation for the business analyst, from my own standpoint, other organizations then factor the customer satisfaction index. They, they, they actually do a CSAT survey and understand how your customers rate um you as a ba i think that 360 feedback would also help to to develop the the ba going into the future great thank you eugene thank you for highlighting um sam are you there any do we still have a couple of minutes to go through any other questions uh i'm here um i think it's it's a uh, six or seven maybe what we can do Tendai, obviously, um, Eugene and Natasha are available to us, is to kind of um, see how we can uh, connect people. I would, I would really love to have people ask their own questions, but it's fine. Um, so that maybe we can get uh, additional insight and uh, see what we can get. Uh, but before maybe we do that, I just also wanted to introduce um, Garnet. Uh, Garnet is our um, IIBA Zimbabwe chapter board member responsible for sponsorship. And I just wanted to introduce you kind of to Eugene and Natasha. Um, I think we we are very honored to have these guys on the call, and you know these are some strategic relationships that can really help us as we continue to build the IIPA Zimbabwe chapter. Um, I think maybe you guys can connect possibly after the call or something like that. Um, uh, back to your question, Tina. I don't know. Eugene, Natasha, do you guys have another 10 minutes? Um, shall we allow those who want to drop off the call to drop off at this moment in time? Um, and then maybe we can end it. If you guys have had stops, it's perfectly fine. We can also end the meeting at this moment, it's fine. Yeah. We can um, proceed. We can proceed. Um, yeah, I've still got 10, 15 minutes. Okay, cool. So uh, I think today maybe we can go on. It's, it's eight past seven here okay. in... Uh, okay. Zoom. So maybe let's do one, two, just 10 minutes, okay. really exactly 10 minutes. And maybe we can have a bit of an open mic session. I don't yeah. know, movement, yeah. Tim, but do you guys not have any questions? Yeah. <laughs> Whilst people are thinking, I still had a question, um, maybe that I can kind of uh, go to two quick fire questions. I think these ones are pretty simple and straightforward, but these are just questions I've always wanted to ask somebody who hires and who recruits. Um, Number one uh, was the question to do with negotiation. I know I've jumped the gun. We've gone all the way to to to, to offer. When you guys offer that contract, is there room for negotiation? I know in textbook template uh, conversations we say yes, there's negotiation etc. But when you, there's a question around how much do you expect to make, is this open for negotiation etc? Is that something that can get me or lose me at, 
uh, a potential job. So I would say <laughs> there are a couple of things. So in terms of negotiation, I don't think a good company would um, be taken aback by someone wanting to negotiate. Um, but I think it needs to be a meaningful negotiation done in good faith. Um, if somebody is wanting to negotiate and you know, is looking at 5x um, of what they're currently on, then yeah, <laughs> that might be a bit difficult. And you, you then go into um, this, uh, out, you fall outside the zone of potential agreement, um, basically. So I think as long as it's, it's a meaningful negotiation um, and, and you, know, you, you, you navigate it from a good faith perspective, um, a company shouldn't be willing to, to engage that. Um, maybe just to share from my perspective, it's always about understanding that holistic value proposition. So, you know, let's, let's not lie. We were not volunteers in our workplaces. So the, the actual cash in my bank account is, is meaningful. Um, but I would urge people to look at that total compensation package. Um, so that could be, you know, the cash salary, what bonus looks like, um, the extent to which your company will support professional development. Um, are you able to, to travel, um, you know, sort of benefits that are meaningful to you, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the ability to work from home versus, um, you know, completely office-based role, all those things ultimately add up. So yeah, I would say, you know, definitely look at the finances and that's a critical part, but also understand that broader value proposition in, in your negotiation. And it may be that um, you can leverage other things, um, not just the, the financial side. Okay, cool, wonderful. Uh, Eugene, is the negotiation well, a real negotiation or are there pay skills that already have been agreed and it's just to say, okay, whatever you guys offer me, let's go. <laughs> well, uh, I'm, I'm not really much involved in the actual um, remuneration negotiations, but all I know oh, okay. is there is, a, there is a reasonable range where okay. one can negotiate in between and uh, I, I, I will re repeat the word reasonable <laughs> because some people would then bring in these unreasonable um, requirements to the negotiation process, but uh, the organization won't, won't be able to, to meet those in, in, in relation to the organization's compensation and uh, benefit structure or policy. So um, I would say one needs to be reasonable and you, you mentioned something to do with the background knowledge to, to the organization. Um, sometimes uh, there is word out there on the salary ranges. And uh, I would say even for movement within a certain grade within the same market, uh, you shouldn't expect maybe a 100% jump. I know in Zimbabwe, it's everything is sixes and sevens, but in stable economies, you realize that for each job movement, there is a standard change in salary as you change jobs. Maybe they would say a maximum of 20 or 30% and things like that. So that should also help you in the negotiation process. But all I can say is as you interview for roles, you should know your worth and um, one thing that I've realized is, take for example, in this market, organizations uh, have different remuneration uh, structures. And what people fail, some people, what some people fail to understand is the difference in policies. Take for example, some use a total cost to company, some do a pay with benefits and if you don't fully calculate your benefits, you will be disappointed once you, after you move and you realize that you've actually moved for, for something that is less than what you're getting. So you need to fully understand the, the package, ask what it means. And um, I think it will get, help guide you either in the negotiation process or 
in um, accepting the offer. I think that's that's all from my end. No, thanks for that, Eugene. Yeah, you can go ahead, Natasha. Rachel has a question, but I just wanted to yeah, yeah. something Eugene said around um, companies and the different remuneration policies. Um, also, if you before accepting an offer can get sight of what that policy is, um, then then ask because it has an impact on things like how quickly you can be promoted. I know in some companies you can't be promoted within the first 12 months. Um, you can't apply for a role internally within the first year, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, just get that full picture um, before you, you make a, a final decision. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. I think it's a very uh, valuable and interesting insights, um, especially just to know that there's like 20% to 30% negotiation room. Um, and even just to kind of do some research around the policies. Uh, Rachel, I know your hand's been up for a bit, please go. Uh, good evening, everyone. So my question is on the issue of salary. So let's say I'm earning a, a good salary and the recruiter asks for my current salary. If I put my actual salary, does that disqualify me if the recruiter's offer is less than what I've put? what I'm currently earning. Yeah, I mean, this is something something that's quite contentious. Um, so I would, I would be honest, but understand the reason behind the, the, the information request. So you, you can say no, um, and rather say to the recruiter, the, the company that you've represented me um, to, knows what my background and experience is, um, my preference would be for them to put an offer on the table first, um, and then we can kind of proceed from there. Um, it's down to what you're comfortable with. Um, some recruiters are given a specific budget. So the reason that they are asking is to, I suppose, not waste either party's time. If really what you're expecting, um, or even what you're currently on is, is really outside of of the company's budget. But yeah, I would say, let them make the first move if possible. Um, but sometimes it can, it can disqualify you. But a good recruiter will typically have that information in their initial discussion with you about potential job opportunities. You know, what are you on? What are you looking for, et cetera? And the assumption is having had that kind of in-depth conversation to understand what you're looking for, that they will represent you to the organizations where there's alignment between what you want and what they're willing to offer. So it shouldn't be that you go through an entire process and it falls apart because what you want is way above the budget um, that they have. So try and have the conversation certainly earlier on um, with the recruiter. Um, but if they do request it and you're not comfortable to say to them, can, can the company put an offer first um, and take it from there? All right. Thank you, Natasha. I think some organizations offer a great degree of flexibility. Maybe your performance in that interview will push the hiring manager to break bank and approach HR to say, I want this person at, at all costs. So you also need to understand the flexibility within the organization that you, you, you are interviewing for. Okay, thanks for, for, for this, Eugene and Natasha. I think Rachel's question has been answered um, very well. Okay, so it's 18 past seven. I know it was a very interesting topic and we could really go on. <laughs> But I, I'll release you guys to, um, you know, to carry on with life. Uh, thank you so much for making time, uh, Eugene, Natasha. We really appreciate uh, some of these insights. I think this is a very safe space to kind of have that conversation um, where you're not necessarily in the situation and, you know, needing to give correct answers to the recruiter and also just to be to understand uh, specifically for business analysts, what does it mean to get recruited? What can you expect in an interview process? Um, and, you know, what 
what's under the hood? What what kind of uh, mechanics are at play when when you when you are in an interview? Um, I think it would be also interesting to kind of talk about a CV writing agency, but maybe let's shelve that one. We can pick it up in a different session another time. Um, I'll just let you guys maybe have some some last comments or remarks around maybe overall the overall topic or any um, thoughts, ideas, or maybe if you're recruiting, if you just want to put it out there, there's a whole bunch of PAs here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think, yeah, just to end off from my side, thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, it's been a pleasure and um, and hopefully we've given people some, some food for, for thought on this call. I think just to end off, I would say, you know, really take initiative when it comes to, to your career um, as a BA um, and really commit to kind of ongoing learning um, about what's out there, you know, where you may need to upskill, um, connecting with people within the broader BA community. Um, I know when you are looking for a job, depending on the circumstances that led you to that point, it can be overwhelming, but you would be surprised how much is actually within your control. And just the, the, the intellectual capacity and social capital that you can leverage off in your network um, to get you to the next level. So yeah, I would just encourage people to, to really take take ownership and, and know that there's a lot more within their control um, than outside of their control. But yeah, thank you for the time. Thank you for the questions as well. It was, it was a good discussion. No, thank you so much, Natasha. Really, we really appreciate your presence. Uh, Eugene, any parting uh, shots you from your hand? Yes, uh, I would say by parting words um, for everyone on this call to stay hungry and um have a clear growth plan your professional and uh, personal uh, development plan so that even as you join uh, a new organization you should know where you want to go i i know natasha spoke about um the issue of upskilling um academic development etc but um that's the most important thing in today's modern organization you realize that um, what what leaders look out for is people who can develop to the next level and um, i would say have um, a professional development plan ready and know where you want to be within the next year within the next three years and have a drive to place yourself where you want to go I, I once worked with um, a CEO who said, Eugene, you should develop to a level whereby you determine your, your own salary. And that's what I want to encourage you to, to go to. Being a BA is not the, the, the ultimate position that you can attain, or also aim to move to maybe other, other roles, other levels, uh, for example, a solution architect, uh, an enterprise architect, project manager, program manager, et cetera, so that we see each other develop over the years. And um, I'm sure you also don't want to be 45, 50 and still a BA. Thank you very much and um, stay hungry. Right, wonderful. Uh, thanks guys. Uh, I don't think there's anything more to add. Um, to, to the wonderful words that Natasha and Eugene have left us, just to say thank you so much for making time. Uh, I know you guys know this is just voluntary. We, we're we not paying Natasha or Eugene to be here, but they've just taken time out, I think, out of their care um, and support for, for the IIBAs in community. So we'll also reach out to you guys whenever we need help. Um, I think it's, uh, like I said again at the beginning, this is a family, let's keep connected and uh, helping each other to, you know, to do better BA work and uh, pushing forward our careers. Thanks everybody for joining. Let's uh, see each other in the next session um, next month. And... Oh, thank you. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Cheers. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.